Hello everyone, welcome back to the next lecture of our architecture design and use cases course. We've been going through different notions of security and privacy. So last lecture we look, looked at what are what is transaction privacy, data privacy, user privacy, and what are the different constructs one could use to achieve privacy. And now we're going to look at one other uh, construct, a very important construct in Hyperledger Fabric that allows you to achieve data privacy. So we look at that, so it's, it's called SideDB. So before we get to SideDB itself, let's look at just the ledger aspect of Hyperledger Fabric. Right? So what are the things we are storing on the blockchain, on the ledger? So we're going to store the blockchain itself. So this is the chain link of blocks with transactions in each block. And apart from that, we have a state database that holds the data that is handled by the smart contracts. So each smart contract can have its own private data store. And in that data store, it can store information that it seeks to keep immutable on the blockchain. And these transactions are referring to data in the state database um, as part of the uh, smart contract invocations. Now, on top of the state database, there are a couple of, a few index indices that are created. One is a history index, which says which transaction is in which block and a history of all such transactions over time. And there is also a block index, right? All these are stored, the indexes are stored on the state database in, let's say, level DB uh, for Fabric. And for the state database itself, there are two, two options. One is you could use, today at least there are two implementations. Hyperledger Fabric gives you a pluggable interface for uh, your database definition. Today there are two implementations. One is that of LevelDB, which is an embedded key value database. And it supports basic functionality, right? So it, embed, it supports uh, key queries. So I can give you a particular key, ask for the value. Uh, it allows composite key queries and also allows range queries. So give me all keys from A to B right, in that range. That's just a basic, uh, very simple key value store. The slightly more sophisticated one is CouchDB, which is uh, which really a document store. It supports, uh, so basically each key is really a document. It's re it can be a JSON document. Um, and it supports key queries, composite queries, range queries, uh, plus full data rich queries. So for instance, in the level DB case, the data is really a blob, but in CouchDB, you can actually sp uh, have a schema and ask specific queries about data within a particular document itself or a particular key. So this is what I mentioned. So with level DB, it's a very simple key value store. So all you can just is do is get the entire value for a particular key, a few additional composite key and range query capabilities. But these may not be sufficient for many uh, applications, right? So if you want to do more sophisticated query cap uh, queries in your chain code, it's really not, this may not um, be sufficient, right? Uh, you might want to use a, a document store such as CouchDB where you can you can do much more richer queries um, on the blockchain. And it can also get uh, richer uh, reporting and analytics performed on, on the chain, use, using chain code. Okay, so now coming to why SideDB, right? So what we, uh, what many, uh, we've seen many applications ask for or many industry use cases ask is the ability to be able to selectively share particular pieces of data with only certain entities. And blockchain by default replicates all the data across all the peers. So even if you have channels, all the entities, all the participants of a channel will see all the data. So suppose you have some data that you consider private that you want, to, you want to share only with a subset of participants within a, within a channel, right? So that data you want to keep private and only let's say three out of 10 people should see that data, no one else, right? How do you do that? The SideDB provides that kind of a capability where I can, for each, for each data element, I can specify who are the other peers who will see that data. So it gives you uh, privacy even within a channel so that only subset of the peers see it. It also gives you privacy with respect to the ordering service. So even the ordering service will not see that private data. They will only see a hash, right? And anyone querying just the blocks of transactions, just looking at the, the blockchain itself, will also not see the private data. So across the peers, the blockchain, as well as the order, we can ensure data privacy of specific private data. And this is, it comes in handy for many um, applications where audit requirements are, there is a stringent compliance and audit requirements. 
uh, and there are also regulatory requirements, so such as healthcare, KYC, insurance, and many financial services use cases also. Um, so the way uh, it does that is only the evidence of the private data, maybe a hash, is going to be uh, is going to be on the transaction and will be seen by the ordering service. So all the other information is kept private to a subset of the authorized peers. Okay, so um, the chain code is uh, is going to store both the public data as well as uh, private data and the private data will only be with authorized entities only the hash of the private data gets onto the transaction now the private data is it's possible to group them into collections so collections is a notion where i can say okay collection a has these three peers collection b has these five peers so i can create those collections and i can have data within those collections so if a particular data element is in a collection, that data element will only be seen by participants of the collection. And just like channels, it's also possible for the membership of the collections to change over time. Right? Uh, so collections are again associated with access policies. So you can define who can read the data, who can write data. So those access policies can be defined for each collection. And uh, the, as I said, the private data is only stored on the peers who satisfy that access policy. So again, the distinction from channel channels is that within a channel, everyone sees all data, but site DB is a construct whereby you can prevent certain private information to be seen by, to not be seen by all parties in the channel. So it can be seen by only a subset. The private data is also not in the transaction, in the, not in the um, block of transactions it's also not seen by the order. So the unauthorized entities, even if they are authorized within a channel, they only see the hash, they won't see the private data. So how does this all work? So let's take just one collection, right? So um, let's say there is a endorsement and that endorsement is going to be, have two parts to it. it this, 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 this is basically a transaction proposal, they'll have two parts. One is a primary read-write read write set. So what this means is, this is the public information that anyone in the channel can see. So this is really the, read, the set of data elements that are read and written by the chain code, which is public. That is the primary read-write set. Apart from that, there's gonna be private data in a collection. That's the private, private read-write set. And for that, only a hash of that private read-write set is captured in the endorsement itself, in the transaction. So in the endorsement phase, only the hash of the key and hash of value is written to the public state. The actual key comma value of the private information is held in a separate deep database, which is called the side DB. So in this case, so there is a public state information and there is a private state and these are held separately. The private state is then disseminated using gossip. The public state is part of the transaction and all the peers will get the transaction, but the private information is then distributed using uh, gossip um, in Fabric. What happens after that? So now you've written the hash of the key and hash of value into the transaction. So th that makes sure that allows immutability. And there is a private data set that only a subset of the peers in the channel have. Now, how does validation take place? Now, the validation, of course, of the public read write set happens as before. Apart from that, the hash read write set on all the committing peers, they will also check the key. Right, sorry, they will also check the version. So there is a hash of the key and it has a particular version. You can check that that version um, is not duplicated, right? So no two transactions in a particular block are reading uh, the same uh, information. So let's say transaction A reads a particular version for a private data and modifies it in some way. So it's gonna, it's gonna be part of the right set. So it tries to modify the data. If transaction B had the same version, it means that it's read uh, stale information because there's a previous transaction in the block that has modified the private information. If transaction B tries to uh, modify that same element in the same block, then that will be rejected because the version on the hash of the key can be checked, right? If both of them are at version 1.0, then the second one will get rejected. So that's really almost like a, the same validation that Fabric does on state, state variables. This is similar to not allowing double spending. That's the same account to uh, um, 
uh, two spends cannot be made from that, right? So that really is uh, how validation also happens. The validation happens on the hash of the key rather than the key itself. Um, now, likewise, just as we had one collection, it's possible to have multiple collections. So you can have different collections with different subsets of, of peers. And they're all held as separate state information. So there's private state one, private state two. Um, and in this example, collection one is persisted between peer one and peer two. And uh, there is uh, partitions two and three, they are persisted by just one of the peers, right? So par private, state, private state two resides only in peer one, private state three resides only in peer two. So they are, they are bifurcated. Right? And the, only the hash of those values get into the public state. Okay, so um, these collections, so how does the life cycle work? The collections can be defined at the time of chain code deployment. So I can say these are the collections. These data elements, when you're writing into the, uh, when, the uh, when the chain code is going to write this uh, state information into the ledger, it will specify whether this is public or whether it's a private collection. And it's possible to easily add or remove collections over the life cycle of the chain code. Over time, you can add new collections or remove collections. You can also, using the channel configuration transaction, you can also configure transactions. So you can add new members to a collection, you can remove members from a collection. So all that is possible, right? So all that is happens through channel reconfiguration. Okay, so that's uh, really in a nutshell, the, the whole uh, state DB notion of how subsets of entities within a channel can really hold private data just amongst them. That data is shared with others through gossip, with the other authorized entities through gossip. What is there in the public blockchain itself is just a hash of that private data. Right? So in some sense, immutability is guaranteed by the platform itself. So the no party can modify this private data. So the other people who have the private data will be able to uh, detect that because the hash is on the public chain. Um, and double spends are also avoided because validation can be performed using version information on the hash of the key. Right? The key itself is not revealed, only the hash of the key is in the public state. So to get more details, uh, you can check out the Fabric documentation on Ledger. It gives you good details and also a working example of how SciDB works. So this really helps provide data privacy amongst a subset of participants within a, within a channel and also with respect to the ordering service. Okay, so that ends this lecture on using SiteDB as a construct for privacy. Um, so with this, I think we've seen a range of uh, constructs for providing security and privacy in blockchain platforms. And this is a very hot area for research and, and innovation. There's a lot of action going on in both academia as well as industry in this space. With that, thanks a lot. I'll see you in the next lecture.